Hey everyone, today I'm super excited to be bringing you a full deep dive into Nest.js and Drizzle ORM. Drizzle ORM is an object relational mapper that's going to allow our code to talk to the database with ease. We're going to be using Postgres in this deep dive. We're going to use Drizzle to define all of our database schemas in TypeScript and generate type safe code with ease. We're going to run database migrations and work our way through the majority of the bits of the Drizzle documentation that you need to get up and running with Drizzle in a Node.js or Nest.js project right away so you can start utilizing this awesome ORM. We're going to be covering CRUD functionality, relations, database transactions, testing, and so much more in this deep dive. By the end of it, you'll have a great understanding of Drizzle ORM. So let's go ahead and jump right in. I'll see you there. So before we jump in, if you like this video and would like to get more additional exclusive content around Nest.js, DevOps, UI, and backend technologies, be sure to check out my website, michaelguay.dev, where you can sign up and get access to a monthly subscription where you get full access to all of my best-selling Udemy courses, as well as monthly exclusive lectures, which consist of hours of additional exclusive content. So I'll leave the link below in the description if you'd like to learn more. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with initializing our project. We're gonna use the Nest.js CLI to initialize our Nest.js application. If you don't have the Nest.js CLI, you can simply install it globally with NPM using npm install g at nest.js slash CLI at latest to get the latest version and go ahead and install this globally. All right, so now that I have the Nest CLI, we'll utilize it to create our new app. So I'll run Nest new, and I'll call this Nest.js Drizzle, and I'll use pnpm as my package manager. So with our dependencies finished installing, we can now cd into our project directory, and I'll open it up inside of a code editor. So I've opened up the project in VS Code, and we can see the starting application for a Nest.js project. Now, if we open the source directory, we'll go into our main.ts file, which is the entry point to our application. And here we're calling our bootstrap function, which is creating our application using the app module, and then exposing traffic on port 3000 by calling app.listen to start our express HTTP server to start listening for HTTP connections. So if we open up our app module, we can see our starting app controller and our app service. This is a provider that we can inject into other providers in our application. And this app controller is our entry point for HTTP traffic. If we open up our app controller, we can see the app controller decorator, which marks it as a controller. And in here we have our single get route, which is exposing this get hello function. So we can see we're also injecting the app service into this app controller, which we're using to call get hello. So in the app service, we're simply returning this stub string of hello world. We mark this service as a provider with the at injectable decorator, which means we can inject it into other Nest.js classes using our dependency injection. And this is all wired up into our app module, which is bootstrapped by our bootstrap function. So we should be able to go ahead and start our project with the start dev command. If we look in our package JSON, Nest.js exposes this start dev command, which is going to start up our development server in watch mode to automatically look for changes to our code and recompile it. So let's go ahead and test it out by running pnpm start dev. So this will go ahead and compile our app. We can see it successfully started and we're watching for change. We can also see our single get route that is mapped. So now I'm going to go ahead and open up Postman to test our HTTP get route. So we should be able to open up Postman and launch a request at localhost. So HTTP colon slash slash localhost 3000, which is the port that we're listening for traffic on. If we send this request to the server, we have a 200 status code meaning we've succeeded and we have this hello world stub string being returned as expected. So our Nest.js application is initialized, running, and ready to integrate with Drizzle to persist some data to a database. 
All right, so firstly, we're going to need to make sure we have a database running that our Drizzle ORM can actually connect to. Now, in this project, we're going to use Postgres as our database of choice, which Drizzle offers first class support for. Now to run our Postgres database, I'm going to utilize the Postgres Docker image and run it using Docker Compose, which is a way to orchestrate and manage Docker containers. Now for this to work, of course, you'll need to have Docker installed on your machine. I have Docker Desktop installed, which allows me to run Docker containers locally. I'll leave a link below if you need to get Docker Desktop installed on your machine. So now that I have Docker up and running, let's go ahead and create a Docker Compose YAML file, which is going to describe the instructions to actually run a Docker container. So in the root, we'll create a new Docker Compose.yaml. And now let's go ahead and describe this manifest so we know what containers to run and provide it with some more details. So we start off with a services key which is going to contain all of the containers that this docker compose file is orchestrating now i'm going to go ahead and call this postgres and call it whatever we want however now in here we define the actual docker image that we're going to be running so in our case by default this will look at the docker hub repository which is the official default repository for docker images so i've simply navigated to doc hub.docker.com and looked up the Postgres image that we're going to pull. So this is the official Postgres Docker image here with over a billion downloads. And this is the one we're going to go ahead and pull and run on our machine. So let's go ahead and do that. We can see the instructions here by simply running Docker pull Postgres. So this image we can simply just call Postgres, which is going to look at Docker Hub by default. So now we have the correct image. Let's also now define a ports array. And so this ports array is going to be a list of ports that are going to be mapped on the running container to our local machine. So this is the port that we're going to open up on our local machine on localhost that's going to receive traffic from the container. Now we do a colon and now we're going to map to the open port on the running container. So in our case, that's also 5432. That's the default port that Postgres is listening for for database connections. So again, this is the source port on our local machine, 5432. We're mapping to the running Docker container at 5432. So we're able to send and receive traffic to this running Docker container. Now the last step is to define some environment variables for this Postgres container. To do this, we'll su supply an environment object where we want to supply a Postgres password. I'll simply use example for the password and then the Postgres DB. So that's going to be the database that we'll create by default. I'll simply call it nest.js drizzle. So now we're ready to actually use this Docker compose file and start the Postgres container defined in here. To do this, we're going to go back to our terminal and open up a new terminal window in the same directory that our project is in. So you can see I have another tab here. And now I'm going to use the docker compose command and run the up command, which is going to start all containers defined in the docker compose.yaml, which is the default file name it's going to look for. So now you can see that my logs from the docker container have been outputted here. Our container has successfully started up and we can see the Postgres logs here telling us that the database system is ready to accept connections. We're listening for traffic on this loopback address of 0000, so all IP addresses on the container and the port 5432, which we know we're automatically forwarding traffic on our local machine at the same port. So we should be able to now access this Postgres container at localhost 5432 since that's where we're going to forward traffic to. Okay, so next up, I've gone ahead and opened up a database GUI tool that I use called PG Admin 4. If you'd like to use it as well, I'll leave a link to install it below. It's totally free to use. It's just going to allow us to connect to our database and look at the schema and the data with inside of it. So in PG Admin 4, I'm going to go ahead and establish a connection to our Postgres container by right clicking on servers and clicking register server. And I'll go ahead and call this local. 
and click on connection tab and the host name will be localhost which is our local loopback address where we're sending traffic to and we know this postgres port 5432 is automatically being forwarded to our running docker container where postgres is listening for connections so next we can go ahead and also provide the password which in our case we know was example so go ahead and provide your password here from the docker compose and the default username is simply postgres so go ahead and click on save and now you can see we've established this connection to our database. Now you can also see we also have the Nest.js Drizzle database, which we told Docker Compose about through that environment variable. So it's automatically created the database for us. And now inside of this schemas tab, we can open up schemas, scroll down and see the tables. Of course, we have no tables yet because we have no data in this database. So next up, now that we can actually connect to our running Postgres container, let's go ahead and start integrating Drizzle ORM so we can start creating our database schema inside of this Postgres container and start persisting data to it. Now, before we jump in with integrating Drizzle with our Nest.js application, I want to let you know about the Drizzle docs, which we're gonna be essentially going through in this video while we build out our application. So I'll go ahead and leave several useful links below to these docs on different aspects that we touch on in this project. So be sure to check out that description for additional resources. The docs are extremely useful to learn more about the concepts you're going to learn in this video. So I highly recommend going through this video first and then heading over to the docs to solidify your knowledge. So let's go ahead and jump in with this integration. All right, so our first step is going to be to actually install the dependencies we need to create this Drizzle integration. So let's go ahead and install the dependencies by pnpm add drizzle ORM and then PG for Postgres. Go ahead and let these dependencies install. So now I also want to add with dash D for development Drizzle kit. Drizzle kit is the framework that Drizzle offers to generate and execute database migrations based off of our database schema. We'll finally also install the types for Postgres. So we have all the dependencies we need for Drizzle itself. I also want to install at nest.js config, which is how we're actually going to inject environment variables into our application through the .env library, which nest.js uses under the hood in this wrapper library nest.js slash config it's going to allow us to read in environment variables from a .m file opposed to hard coding them which we want to avoid so let's go ahead and install this as well and now we've installed these dependencies the first thing i want to do in our application is establish a connection to our postgres container now i want to abstract this into a new module in our application. So let's go ahead and do that. Firstly, before we do that, I want to clean up our starting app by deleting all these starter files that we don't need. So I'll remove our app service and app controller files and also remove the references from the app module so we start completely clean. And now we're ready to generate this new database module that I wanna to create to host our connection to this Postgres database. So to do this, we'll utilize the nest.js CLI by opening up a terminal and run nest generate module database. So this is gonna go ahead and create a new database folder with this empty database module inside. The database module will also be imported into the app module so nest knows about it. So we have the module itself, which is excellent. Let's go ahead and now set up this connection to our Postgres container using Drizzle ORM inside of the database module. So I want to create this single database connection using Drizzle ORM that our entire application can share. Now, Nest.js makes this concept very easy, of course, with the idea of providers, which are objects we instantiate once in our application, and then we can object these providers or objects into other classes at runtime. 
So we're just simply going to define this new provider that's going to describe our database connection using Drizzle. And then we can inject this database connection provider when we need to get access to the database. So let's go ahead and do this by using the providers array. And let's create a new object literal where I want to create the new database connection provider. To do this, we provide the provide key, which is going to be the injection token. So the injection token is going to be the key that we use when we tell Nest.js that we want to inject this value later on. So let's go ahead and create a new constant for this. In the database folder, I'll create a new database connection dot ts and we'll simply export const database connection and export a string called database connection so a provider injection token is simply nothing more than just a string value or any constant so now we provide it here with the database connection string so now we have a way to identify this provider we want to now actually provide it with a Drizzle ORM database connection. Now, in order to do this, we're going to need to get access to our environment variables using that Nest.js config library we installed earlier to read in environment variables from a .m file. Nest.js config provides us with a service that we can use to pull environment variables off of a .m file. Now, to actually get access to this, well, let's firstly go ahead and initialize this config module inside of our root app module. So before we import the database module, I'll also now add a new import for the config module from Nest.js config and call for root on it, which is going to import it and initialize it. So we can see here for root call is going to load our environment variables and make them available to the config service. Now finally, we can also supply an options object in here to the config module to specify some options. In our case, I'll set the is global property to true, which is simply gonna make the config module available to all of our modules in our application by default. And that'll be useful because we'll need to get access to its config service. Let's go ahead and get access to the config service by using the use factory property here, which is going to allow us to inject dependencies directly inside of a callback function using Nest.js dependency injection. So if we wanted, we could hard code this database connection using use value here and simply provide a hard coded constant. But in our case, we know we want to pull this off of an environment variable. And to do this, we need to inject our config service. So we're going to use use factory here in order to do this. So like I said, this takes in a new callback function, which is essentially the factory that's going to return the underlying provider. However, now we can actually inject dependencies in here as parameters. So I'll inject the config service from Nest.js config. And now in this factory function, we're now going to create our Drizzle ORM database connection using the config service. Now, firstly, we need to understand two separate kind of connections that Drizzle Postgres offers us. Firstly, we have a direct client connection, which is going to establish a single connection to the database that our entire application will share. Now, if we have some sort of application that we only expect a single user to utilize, like a command line application, this isn't too much of an issue. We can use this single client connection. However, more than likely, you're building an application that multiple users are going to be utilizing where we expect to have multiple concurrent requests to our database. So in this case, we want to provide a pool of reusable database connections that our application can utilize concurrently, opposed to having just a single one that all of our requests will block behind. Well, Node Postgres, the underlying library we're utilizing, for our Postgres connection in Drizzle offers this with the help of a pool object, which creates many connections to our Postgres database and shares these connections for concurrent requests, which is going to increase throughput to our database. So to do this, we'll create a new const pool, which is equal to new pool from Postgres. 
So this connection pool takes a configuration object. So here we can define the properties on this connection pool, for example, max or min, to de describe the maximum and minimum number of connections we want to establish to the DB. In our case, we'll use all of the default values, but now supply this connection string parameter, which contains the connection details to the underlying Postgres database. And this is gonna be the value that we're gonna pull off of the config service from an environment variable. So we can finally use the config service and call get or throw on it. So this is going to pull a environment variable off of the current process or throw an error if it doesn't exist. So in our case, we'll look for the database URL. So now we have this connection pool provided to, with our connection string, which is going to contain the details needed to connect to the database. We now want to return a drizzle object using this pool. So we return drizzle, and now we need to go ahead and import drizzle. So go ahead and import drizzle from drizzle ORM slash node Postgres, which is our underlying drizzle library. So this drizzle constructor function is going to take in the client. In our case, that's going to be the Postgres pool that we just established. So we're providing it with the underlying connection to the database. And then we have a config object, which is going to describe the options to the underlying Drizzle ORM. So the only property that we need to configure on this Drizzle ORM is the schema. So this is going to be our underlying database schemas, which we're going to define in our TypeScript code, which Drizzle is going to use to generate type safe operations for our application. So to provide it with the schema, we're gonna create a new object and provide all of our schemas inside of here. For now, we don't have any schemas yet, so this will be an empty object. So we'll leave this as is. So let's go ahead and fix a couple of typos here. So this should be provide and also we want this constant to be database connection so fix this typo and then go back to the database connection and fix it here as well so now our database connection provider is successfully instantiating this connection pool to the underlying postgres database and then we create the underlying drizzle orm object which we're going to use later on in our actual service code to interact with the database and actually fetch and create data the only other thing we need to define here in this use factory is a new property called inject. And this is going to be the list of dependencies that NestJS expects to be injected here into this use factory. So in our case, we know that's simply gonna be the config service. So now we've defined the database module and the database connection provider. We're ready to actually inject this drizzle ORM object into one of our services and start seeing how we can use it to interact with our database. Firstly, if we go back to our logs, we can see that it's actually crashing because the environment variable we defined here, database URL, doesn't exist yet. So let's go ahead and fix this by going back to our project. And in the root of the project, we'll create a new .m file, which is where NestJS config will look for environment variables by default and so now in here, we'll create this database URL environment variable, and we'll set it equal to this string. So Postgres colon slash slash, that's the protocol. And now we need to provide the username and password. So we know that's Postgres for the username, an example for the password, at, and now the host is localhost port 5432, and finally, the database name we're connecting to. So this is the fully qualified connection string to our underlying Postgres container running inside of Docker. Finally, go back to our application and restart the server so it, le so it loads in the .env. And now you can see we're successfully starting our application and we now have this connection to our Postgres database and the Drizzle ORM object instantiated we're ready to start working with it and creating our first drizzle schemas, which is gonna define the shape of our database. Let's go ahead and do this next. All right, so to start off, let's go ahead and initialize a new module into our application that can actually start utilizing our 
drizzle object. So let's go ahead and again use the Nest.js CLI to do this. So in my terminal, I'll go ahead and use Nest generate module. And our first module will be for users. So we'll generate a users module. And let's also go ahead and generate a controller for it and a service. So this is so we can accept HTTP traffic and define some specific routes. And then also a service to implement our business logic. So this has gone ahead and generated our new users folder, where inside of here we can see we have the users controller decorated with the controller decorator and prefixed with users. So we'll add our HTTP routes in here. We have an empty user service and finally the users module, which actually defines the users controller and the users service as a controller and a provider. And finally, it's also added it to the app module here. So we've brought it into our Nest.js application. And now we have this users module. Let's go ahead and in our user service, we'll actually inject the drizzle ORM database connection that we've already established inside of the database module. Okay, so with our users module in place, let's now go ahead and define our drizzle schema for just this users module. So in our case, I wanna separate out my database schemas per module or per feature in this case. So for the users directory here, we'll have a schema that's specific just to users and we'll have just the users related tables defined in that schema. So let's go ahead and create this new schema.ts file inside of users where we'll define this drizzle ORM Postgres schema. So if you've used Prisma ORM in the past, it's quite similar. The only difference is here, we're actually defining the schema inside of TypeScript directly, which means we don't actually have to run a separate command to generate our TypeScript types. These are all gonna be generated when we compile our TypeScript code, which is really excellent. So let's go ahead and define our first table in the schema, and that's gonna be the users table where I want to store new users. So in here, let's go ahead and export const users. And this is gonna be equal to a call to the PG table function. And here you can see, we have the ability to import it from drizzle ORM slash PG core. And that's where we want to import it from. And the first argument we give this function to create a new Postgres table in our schema is simply the name of the table. So in our case, we'll call this users. And then the second argument here is gonna be an object where we just simply define the columns inside of this Postgres table. So in our case, I wanna add three columns for a given user. The ID of the user to uniquely identify it. This is also gonna be the primary key for the user. And we also wanna store the email and password for the user. So let's start off with the ID. So in Drizzle Postgres, we can represent an ID value using the serial function from PG Core. And this is going to be equivalent to an auto increment function in something like Prisma. It's essentially just going to ensure that this value is always automatically incremented based off of the existing value. So the first user that gets inserted will have ID one, next user will have ID two, and so on. So the serial function helps us to accomplish this. And inside of each column, we need to specify the name for the column as a string value. So we'll call this ID. And then the way this works in Drizzle is for each of these functions we use to describe a column, we have essentially a fluid interface here where we can chain on additional descriptors for this column. So in our case, we can see a number of constraints we can apply to this column. In our case, I want to go ahead and mark this as the primary key for this table. So we can see here, this will implicitly make the column not null, and it's going to apply a unique index on it. Since it is the primary key, it's how we're gonna identify entries inside of this table when later on we have foreign relationships. So we mark this as the primary key using the primary key function. So with this in place, we'll now go ahead and continue with the email property for this user. This value I simply want to take in as any string value. So we can use the text operator from PG core, which is gonna mark this field data type as text, meaning it can accept a string value of any length. So again, we need to define the name for this column. We'll call this email. 
And I also want to apply a constraint for this email to make it unique so we can't have duplicate emails in our database, which is going to be important for authentication in most apps. To do this, again, we can apply one of these constraints here, the unique constraint, which automatically create a unique index on this column to ensure that we don't have duplicate emails. So we have the ID, email, and now let's finally add the password as well. And so this will simply be another text field that we'll call password as the column name. So now we have a complete definition for our users table inside of our Postgres database. This is excellent. Let's go ahead and now see how we can actually apply this Postgres table against our running database because of course this is the schema of our database in TypeScript code but it doesn't actually match what the database looks like. To do this we need to generate a migration script that will actually be able to perform the operations necessary to get the database in line with this schema. Thankfully we installed Drizzle Kit earlier which is a tool that allows us to generate and execute migrations based off of these schema files using Drizzle. So next up, let's see how we can implement database migrations using Drizzle. All right, so let's get started with configuring Drizzle Kit, the framework we're going to use to generate and execute database migrations based off of our Drizzle schema. Now to do this, we simply create a file in the root of our application that sets up a configuration for Drizzle Kit. We're going to call this drizzle.config ts and this is the default file that drizzle kit will look for so in here we're going to export default a function call to define config so go ahead and import define config from drizzle kit so define config is going to take in an options object where we tell it the details of our application schema files, which is going to use to generate the migrations from, as well as the database connection details. So the first property to define is the schema property, and that's going to tell it where to look for our Drizzle schema files that it's going to generate the migration scripts from. So in our case, we know that'll be in the source directory. We can use a wildcard here to then look for any subdirectory and look for any files called schema.ts, which is the file naming convention we're going to use in this project. We'll simply call it schema.ts. So this will look at all of our schema files, and then we can define an out property to say where we want to define our output, or in our case, where to put the database migration scripts that Drizzle Kit will generate. We also need to define a dialect which is essentially the database we're going to be using. So that's PostgreSQL. And then finally, the DB credentials, which is how to actually connect to the database that we're going to execute the migrations against. Now we can go ahead and utilize the URL property just as we've done inside of our NestJS application. And let's pull off of the process.env.database URL. So Drizzle Kit will automatically load in our environment variables from .env, so we'll have access to this database URL, and we'll actually be providing our connection string here to Drizzle Kit. So with our Drizzle config set up, let's go ahead and now use Drizzle Kit to generate some migrations from our new schema file. To do this, we'll run pnpm Drizzle Kit generate to generate new migrations based off of our schema files that we've told this. So now if we go back to VS Code, we can see we have this new Drizzle folder because this pnpm drizzle kit generate command, well, we can see here, it actually read in our config and generated this new users table and generated the SQL migration file to this Drizzle folder. So now inside of here, we can see the raw SQL that it's actually generated to get our database in line with our TypeScript schema. So in this case, we're simply creating the user's table, defining the columns on it, and applying the constraints we specified, like the primary key, not null, and unique index on the email. So now that we have this migration SQL script created, we now want to run it against our running Postgres database to create the table.
And we can use drizzle kit again to do this. We'll just now run pnpm drizzle kit migrate. So this will apply any migrations specified inside of our output folder against the running database that we provided using our connection string. So we can see here that the migrations applied successfully, which is excellent. If I now go back to PG admin four, and I'll go ahead and refresh our connection to our local database. And now again, we open up our NestJS drizzle database, click on schemas. Now scroll down, you should see inside of tables, we now have this users table that has been created thanks to drizzle kit, which is excellent. We can view right click on it to view all rows. So now we can see the actual schema on this table, including this ID, primary key, the email, and finally the password, all of the columns we specified in our Drizzle TypeScript schema. We can also see the unique constraints applied here, including our unique index on the email and our user's primary key. So this is great. We now have a way to get our database in line with our Drizzle ORM schema at any point by running these two commands. So as we continue to develop our TypeScript Drizzle schemas, we're going to keep rerunning this generate and migrate commands to generate new scripts and then apply them against the database. So now that we have this users table created and the schema defined, it's finally ready to start plugging this into our NestJS app so we can create and query these users. Now, the first thing we want to do is tell Drizzle ORM about this new schema that we created for this user's table. Now, again, the way we do this is by going back to our database module, where we know we're supplying the Drizzle object here, this ORM object, with the master schema object. So in our case, this right now is an empty object. Let's go ahead and spread our user schema now to do this, we're going to import user schema from and now go into our users folder and we're going to import everything from this user schema file. And that's why we're exporting this const users here. So this will be exported as an object. So now that we have this users exported inside of this export object, we can simply spread the user schema inside of the master drizzle schema here. And now to make this work as intended, we need to make sure we import star as user schema from this path here. And so now this will allow us to actually spread the user schema export object, which will contain any of our exported constants in the schema file. So now we're telling drizzle ORM about our user schema inside of this schema object. We're ready to finally inject it into our user service where we can start utilizing it. So in order to actually do this, we'll go ahead and head back to our user service. And in our constructor, we can now finally inject our database connection, which contains our Drizzle ORM object. So in order to do this, we're going to utilize the at inject decorator from NestJS common, where we now provide the injection token. And so this is the same injection token that we specified when we instantiated this provider inside of our database module. So we simply provide the database connection constant as the injection token. And now we have access to this private read only database. And so now for the type of this database object, we can now take this directly from our user schema. To do this, let's go ahead and import star as schema from schema and fix this import to our database connection. So just like we did in the database module, we're importing this schema as an object. And now what we can do is actually specify the type of the database is going to be a node PG database from drizzle ORM slash node Postgres. And now we can pass in our schema type. So TypeScript actually knows about this database and all of our types with inside of it. Thanks to the schema, all we have to do is provide the type of schema. Now, since we're injecting this database connection from the database module, we of course need to make sure in our users module that we're now importing it. So import the database module, which will bring, 
bring in all of the providers that exported from it, including this database connection. And we also need to go into the database module and make sure we add the exports array and say that we are allowing this database connection to be exported from the module and made available to other modules, in this case, the users module. So now in our logs here, you can see our app is compiling successfully. And now in the user service, we can actually interact with this database connection, which is our drizzle object. Let's create an async get users function that will simply use it to retrieve all of the users in our users table. To do this, we return a call to this.database, which is the drizzle object. And now we can see all of the methods that we have access to on here. So we have all of the basic CRUD methods exposed on this drizzle object that we will walk through. In our case, we want to look at the dot query object, which is how we actually pull back data from the database using drizzle. And on this query object, we can actually see it knows about the users table that we expect to be able to query. And this is all thanks to the user schema that we've generated here. Well, Drizzle ORM is smart enough to be able to turn this Postgres table that we defined here into actual TypeScript types that we can now make use of inside of the user service. So the query object has users inside of it. And now we can call find many. And so with this method in place, we can now go back to our users controller where I want to expose a get route. So we'll use at get from nest.js common and simply declare an async get users function in here that all I want to do is now reach out to our user service. So we'll create a constructor that will simply inject the user service like so. So now that we have the user service, we'll simply return this dot user service dot get users and now return all the users in the database through this exposed get route. We can go back to our postman and launch a request to localhost 3000 slash users. And now we execute this get request. We now get back an empty array with no results in it, which is exactly as we'd expect. There's nothing inside of the database, but this is showing us we're now able to establish a connection and actually query results. In the next part, let's actually see how we can create new data inside of this users table and actually pull it back thanks to this query we now have in place. All right, so the first step in updating our app to be able to create a new user will be, of course, to go into our user's controller and create a new route to actually accept HTTP traffic to create the user. So I want to create a new post route in this controller that will allow us to create the user. So I'll create a new at post decorator from Nest Common. And this will be async create user that will return this.userService.create user. And now we need to actually extract the JSON body that's going to be provided to this route, which we know Nest.js makes extremely easy by using the at body decorator to extract the request.body object that lives on the express request object. So this is going to be the underlying request. And now for the type, we can create a new DTO folder inside of users where we'll simply create the create user request file so this will be export class create user request where we have the email of type string and the password of type string so these are the two properties we expect on the incoming json body and we'll provide this type now of create user request and then pass the request into our user service so now let's go back to the user service and in here, we'll go ahead and implement the async create user method. And now we need to use our drizzle ORM database connection to create this new user in the database. But first, let's define the actual parameter into this method that we expect. And this is going to be the underlying create user request. So we'll go ahead and define this user parameter. And we can actually extract the expected type here that Drizzle is going to expect in our insertion call, thanks to our schema, which has been automatically generated from our TypeScript schema. So we can simply provide type of schema.users 
dot infer insert. So this is going to be the type that Drizzle ORM expects for an insert call to create a new record into our user's table. So now we can finally do the insertion by calling this dot database dot insert. And now we provide the actual underlying schema. So in our case, that'll be schema dot users to get our actual table. And now we call dot values to simply provide the value into this database table. So we'll now provide the user parameter. And now we have a way to create a new user in our database. Let's go ahead and test this out using Postman. So now in Postman, I'll create a new request tab. So change this to a post request at slash users. And now we're going to form a body by clicking on the body tab. Click on raw JSON. Now let's create this JSON body where we'll have the email field. So I'll enter in my test email and a password property. So now we have the JSON body. We'll send this to the server and we can see we have a 201 created response that comes back, which is excellent. Now, if we go back to trigger the get call inside of our database, we can now see the actual user record being returned to us thanks to our Drizzle ORM query. Finally, if we take another look at the database directly by going back to PG Admin 4, and I'll just click on this play button to re-execute the query, we can now see the user in the actual database here. So we have the newly created user with my ID, email, and password, just as we'd expect. So this is excellent. Next up, we're going to take a look at relations in Drizzle. So relations are how we represent relationships between our different entities and specifically tables inside of the database. So in this next example, we're going to create posts as a new entity in our application. And we need a way to actually associate those posts with a given user. So in this case, this is a one to many relationship where a single user has many posts. So let's go see how we can model these relations using Drizzle ORM. Firstly, I want to go ahead and create a new Nest.js module to hold this post code. So let's go ahead and in our terminal, we'll run Nest generate module posts, generate this new module. We'll go ahead and do the same thing for a controller and finally a service as well. So as we'd expect, we have the posts folder now with these three generated files. Let's firstly go ahead and import the database module inside of our post module. We know we're going to have to inject the database connection again later on. So let's set this up. And just like we did for our users, we want to create a new schema that's associated just with posts. So posts are going to have their own table inside of our database. So we want a separate schema to model this. Let's go ahead and create a new schema.ts file where now we can define the posts table that we expect just like we did for the users. So we'll export const posts equal to PG table function call from PG core. We're going to pass in the posts table name and now we define the columns on this table. So just as we did for the users, I want an ID, which is going to be that auto incrementing unique identifier. And of course, import serial from PG core as well. And then we can call primary key on it. So we have the ID, which will automatically increment. And then I want a content column, which is going to be the actual underlying text of the post. So import text from PG core. We'll call this content. I'll also specify a published property, which is going to be a Boolean. So whether or not this post is published or not. So we can use the Boolean function from PG core to represent a Boolean type. Now, of course, like I said earlier, I will leave a link below in the docs where you can see all the different types that we have access to through Drizzle Postgres core. So we'll call this published. And now let's say, for example, we want to set a default value for this so that if we don't provide a value, we'll have a default applied by Drizzle ORM directly. To do this, we can use the default function and pass in a default value of false. So meaning if we don't provide a published property, then published will get set to false by default. Finally, let's go ahead and specify a timestamp. So Drizzle 
Postgres has a timestamp that's going to actually represent the current date time when this entry was created in the database. So I'll call this timestamp. And we can use the dot default now function to default this value to the now timestamp, which is going to give us the current date time when it's actually inserted into the database. I now want to go ahead and associate a user with this given post because in our application for every post that's created, we'll have a user that actually is associated with that post who created it. So essentially we need a way to establish a relationship from our posts to our users. In this case, a one to many relationship where we have a single user to many posts. Let's go ahead and model this. So we are going to have the actual user ID column saved directly on a given post. So we'll give this the integer function, which is going to just simply be an integer value. We'll call this user underscore ID. And so now we need a way to actually declare a foreign key using Drizzle. So the foreign key for this given post is going to be the primary key of the user that we want to actually associate. So to create this foreign key that references the user primary key, we can use the dot references function that takes in a callback and this is going to return the user's schema. So we're directly going to use the user's table that we defined in our user's schema here. And we're going to pass in the dot ID property because this is the primary key that we want to associate with the given user. And so this user ID is our foreign key for the given post. And this is how we associate the two with this dot references function. So now that we've defined this column to introduce this foreign key, we now need to actually model the actual relationship between the post and user using a separate function. To do this, we're going to export a new const called post relations, which is going to model all the relations that the post table has. So we'll set this equal to a call to relations from Drizzle ORM. And in here, we pass in the table that we're defining relations for. In this case, the post table we just created. And next, it takes in a callback function where we can extract several parameters depending on the relationship we're actually defining. So in this case, we're going to be defining a one-to-many relationship. So we're going to get access to the one function as the parameter. And we'll open up this callback function that's immediately going to return another object. So we'll wrap it in parentheses and then curly brackets. And so now we're going to go ahead and define a new property that's going to name this relation on the post. In our case, we know this user ID is associated with a user. So we'll call this property user here. Now this user property, of course, isn't actually saved anywhere in this database. It's just to define the actual relation so we can reference it later on in our code. So we're going to set this user relation to the one function that we've extracted from a parameter here. And now the one takes in the actual source table. So where is the relationship starting from? Well, in this case, we know that's the users table that we've already imported. And then this takes in another object here, the relation config to, to describe the fields that are going to map in this relation. So this config takes in two properties. The first is the fields. So this is an array of fields on the source table that are going to be mapping in this relation. In our case, we know that's the user ID property here. This is the foreign key that is going to map to the user's ID. So on the source table, well, we know we can just simply reference the posts dot user ID. So again, we know this is the foreign key. So we set this to the field. And then on the opposing side, we need to now describe the column on the actual user table that we are referencing. To do this, we pass in another property called references, which is an array that actually takes in what columns we're referencing on the target table in this relation. So in our case, we know that's going to be the users.id, which is the primary key of our users. So now we've correctly defined this relation in a given post, which is great. We need to now go ahead and do the same thing on the user side. 
So let's go back to our user schema. Do this, open my user's directory, and open up the schema file. So in here, we're going to follow the same syntax that we just, that we just did for the posts relation. We're going to export a new const called user relations. And this is equal to a call to the relations function. And so this is now going to take in the source table that we're describing the relations for. We know that's the users. And then a callback function where we extract. Well, in this case, we're now defining the many side of this relationship because we're going to tell the user about many posts that it's associated with. So we want to extract the many property. And then we'll go ahead and return this object, which defines all of our relations. So just like we set a user, we're now going to set posts on a single user, and that's equal to the many function call because we have many posts for a single user. And we simply pass in the reference table, which we know is our posts because we have many posts. Make sure we import posts from post schema. And so this is all we have to do to set up our relation on the user side. So now our schema is complete for our posts. We need to go ahead and generate some new migrations for this and execute it against our database. Let's go ahead and do this as we've done before by going back to our terminal and we can run pnpm drizzle kit generate. So we can see here we've generated two tables users, which is going to actually introduce some new relationships and our post table, which has generated five new columns and a foreign key. So let's go ahead and check our code out to see this. We see the drizzle output folder. We can see our new migration script here where we're creating our post table with all of our expected columns using some helper functions as well, like the now function for timestamp. And then we can actually see this code here that is generating our relationships between our posts and a given user. So we can see we're describing the foreign key that we described as the user ID, referencing the user's ID. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and now finally generate this new script, pnpm drizzle kit migrate. So we'll go ahead and apply our migrations. Let's go ahead and refresh our tables where we can now see our new posts table. So if we go ahead and take a look, we can see our expected columns with the correct types. And under constraints, we can also see, well, the primary key here, which is our ID as we'd expect. We also see this new foreign key that Drizzle has introduced for us. And so this foreign key here is what is actually establishing the relationship between a single user and its many posts. So with all of this applied, we now know our database is looking in the correct state. Let's go back to our code and start working with our new posts now that we have actually gotten our database in line with the schema. All right, so just like we did for the users, let's head back to our posts controller, expose a couple of routes here to create and get our posts. So I'll start off with a get route. So async get posts. And all we're going to do here is reach out to our post service and call get posts. So let's go ahead and firstly inject the post service as the constructor. So we'll inject the post service. And so now that we have this, let's go ahead and also define a new post route. So async create post. And in here, return this dot post service dot create post. We'll go ahead and now define the incoming request, which we're extracting with the at body decorator. And so this request will define in the new DTO directory in the posts folder, call this create post dot request and export class create post request. And so this is going to contain the properties we need to create a new post. We know that's going to be the content of type string. We'll also directly take in the user ID that's actually creating the post. So this is a number value. We know that's an integer coming from our Postgres database as the user ID field. And so now we have this DTO defined. Let's go ahead and reference it in the controller. 
So create post request, simply pass it in to our service now. So now let's go to our post service and implement these methods. We'll go ahead and start with async get posts. And so this is going to need to get access again to the drizzle ORM database connection that we've set up in our database module. So just as we followed before, we'll directly inject this database connection using the injectable decorator from Nest Common. And so we know this is private read only database and the type is going to be type of schema. So we need to manually go ahead and import star as schema from schema and make sure we surround this in the node PG database type. So an important thing to note is that since we're importing star as schema like this, everything exported from our schema is coming in as a single object. And so that's why we're able to export our posts like this. So now we've injected the database connection and we're ready to use it inside of get posts. Well, we need to first again make Drizzle aware of our new schema. So just like we did for the users, head back to the database module where we need to add it to our root schema here. So we'll spread the posts schema to add it to our root schema and then just as we did for the user schema, we'll import star as post schema from post slash schema. Let's go back to the post service. And now finally in get posts, we're ready to utilize our injected database. And make sure we change this injectable to at inject from nest.js common. So now in get posts, we can return this dot database dot query and we should automatically see the posts as a type here thanks to our post table defined in the schema. We'll then call find many and retrieve all of them. So get post is complete. We'll go ahead and do create post. So this will take in the post argument. And just like for the users, we'll reference the drizzle type, which is type of schema dot posts dot infer insert. And this will simply await this dot database dot insert pass in now our schema dot posts table. So we know which table we're inserting into and now dot values will take the post parameter. So now we have implemented a way to create and get our posts. Let's go ahead and see this in action in Postman. So I'll launch a get request at localhost 3000 slash posts now, and we can see our expected empty array. So let's launch a new post request at it at slash posts, and we'll add the properties that the request expects. So we'll need the content of the given post, and I'll just enter in some stub text, and then the user ID. So this is going to have to be the actual ID of the user that's already saved in our database. Well, in my case, I know that user ID that I've created in my database is simply one. We can simply check it again. Since it's the first user I inserted, we're going to enter in one as the user ID. So go ahead and send this request. We have a 201 created. And now if we get back the post, we can see we can have the post as expected. We can also see the published value set to default our false value. And the timestamp is the auto-generated time when the record was inserted into the database. So now, <clears throat> so now I want to show you the power of using Drizzle with our relations that we defined before. So now back in our post service, in our get post function, where we're simply reaching out to the database find many, what we can do now is provide an options object. So in find many, we can provide certain options for, for example, a filter to look for certain posts. For now, I want to share with you a property we can set called with. So with is going to allow us to actually pull back any relationships that have been defined on this given entity in the database. So for example, if we actually start typing, 
we can see that Drizzle already knows about the user relation that we defined. And this is thanks to actually providing in the post schema this user property. So it's actually allowing us to define this property, this user property we set here, which it then is going to know how to actually reach out to the user's table and pull back the given user that is associated with the user ID on that post, thanks to this configuration object we defined before. So what we can do is now set this user property to true. And like I just said, this is now going to utilize that relationship we defined, use the foreign key on the post, which is the user ID, and map it to the given user in the users table. So with this in place, we can now go back to Postman and re-execute the get request and now we actually see this new user property that's being sent back with all of the data with this given user in the user's table. And so this is a really powerful feature of Drizzle, which allows us to essentially expand the relationships that we have defined and take a foreign key value like this user ID and actually map it to the record that's saved in another table. So as we've done here, we're now including the user on any given post that's sent back to us. And so I want to show you that this functionality works both ways. So just like we were able to, in our post service, define this with property for the user on a given post, we can do the same thing now for a user. So for the, a given user, we can retrieve all of the associated posts that they have. To do this, we simply follow the same syntax. We're going to pass in the options object into the user service get users function find many we have with here and now we can supply post to true and again since we've defined this relationship inside of our user schema where we're telling it about this posts we'll be able to actually expand and, and retrieve all of the posts associated with this user's ID so let's give this a try now if we go back to postman and now instead of posts we reach out to get all of the users we can see the user I have saved and all of the posts associated with that user. So that's excellent to see. So we've looked at this one to many relation. Let's go ahead and look at the one to one relation where we have one entity or record that's associated with only one other entity. And so we have this one to one mapping. So in this case, we can go ahead and open up our user schema again. So in here, I want to define a new table, a profile, so a user a single user will always have a single reference to one profile and that profile is associated with only one user. So we're going to store these profiles in a separate table and have this one to one mapping between a user and profile. So let's follow our same syntax. We'll export a const profile that will be equal to the PG table. that will go ahead and call profile. And now let's go ahead and define our columns. So I'll go ahead and copy my ID definition so you want a unique ID that is auto-generated. And now let's go ahead and supply some new properties for a user's profile. So let's say we want to define the age of a given user. This will simply be an integer value. And we'll say we have a biography as well, which is simply a text field. And finally, we'll go ahead and now specify the foreign key that associates this profile to a single user. So this is going to look very similar to the foreign key mapping we saw on the users and posts. We simply supply the user ID. This is going to be an integer value. So this column will be stored on the actual profile itself. And then we use dot references function to tell that this foreign key maps to the users dot ID primary key. So make sure we import users table as well. So now we have our completed profile. The last step is to define our relations. So let's start off with the profile relations. We'll export const profile relations, which is equal to the relations function. We'll pass in the profile since that's the table we're defining the relations on. And now we want to pass in the callback. We'll extract the one function because we're going to describe this one-to-one -one relationship with one profile and we'll return an object now where we want to set the user property that's the relationship we're defining on a given profile so we call one pass in that users table 
And just as we've done, we now pass in the config object where we firstly specify the fields array. So what is the foreign key that's actually going to map to the target table? Well, that's going to be the profile.userID. And then we have the references property, which we know is the primary key on the target. So that's, again, users.id. So we've defined the profile relations. We now want to define the relation on the user side. So we'll simply update our user relations object where we already have the posts. We'll also say we have a profile mapping now as well. And we want to define a one-to-one. -one. So firstly, extract the one function call it and pass in the profile which is the target relationship here so we should be all set to now generate some new migrations and apply them against the database let's follow our same procedure so drizzle kit generate it's gone ahead and updated some tables for us created a new migration file and now we'll go ahead and run it with the migrate function so we've successfully applied this migration Let's go ahead and start our server back up. And now let's go ahead and create a new route in the user's controller where we'll expose the ability to create a new profile for a user. So we add a new post route called profile. This will be async create profile. Take in a body, which is the request parameter. And let's go ahead and define this in the DTO directory, just as we did before. I'll create a new create profile request this time and export class create profile request. So again, inside this profile, what we know from the schema, the properties we need to take in will be the age, biography, and user ID. So let's go ahead and add that age number. Biography is going to be a string. And finally, the user ID. Well, of course, that's the number associated with the user table ID. So let's now go back to the user's controller and reference this type as the request. So that's a create profile request. And now we return this dot user service, create profile and pass in that request. And so now we can simply go back to the user service and implement that method. So async create profile gets the profile parameter, which is type of schema dot profile dot infer insert and now I'll we'll await this dot database dot insert pass in schema dot profile dot values profile so now we've successfully implemented the ability to create the profile and now what I want to do is also update get user so just like we've expanded this relationship on the posts let's also now set profile to true so that we return the user's profile whenever we get a new user. So now let's go ahead and test this out. So back in Postman, let's launch a new request, a post request at localhost 3000 users. And remember this route is now prefixed with profile because we supply this to the nest post decorator. So it's users slash profile. And we'll go ahead and fill out our body so give it some stub text for the bio. User ID will set to one. And for my age, we'll say 30. So send this post request to the server. We have the 201 created. Now let's fetch all of our users again. So now in this case, we have not only all of the posts, but the profile associated with my user, even though underneath the hood, if we check PG admin four, well, we're actually storing this in a completely separate table. So if we refresh our tables we should now see this new profile table and inside if we take a look at the data inside of it we see our profile here so thanks to this relation mapping using drizzle rm this is extremely easy to implement let's finally go ahead and implement one last type of relation in drizzle and that's going to be the many to many relation so in this kind of relation we can have many entities map to many other entities. So in our case, the example is going to be a post can have a category associated with it. However, 
a given category can be associated with many posts. And a post, of course, can be associated with many categories. So we have this many-to-many -many mapping. Now, the way we implement this in a SQL database in Drizzle is to create an entirely new kind of table that simply manages this relationship. So as we've seen before, we've been good enough to just save the foreign key and create a new foreign key constraint. But in this case, for the many-to-many -many relation, we need a separate table to manage these relations. So let's go ahead and see how we can do this. So the first thing I want to do is create a new module to host our categories. So let's go ahead and open up our terminal and run nest generate module categories. So just as we've done, we'll generate a module, a controller, and finally a service. So now we have our categories folder with our expected files. Let's go ahead and start off by defining our schema. So the schema for a single category is going to be very simple. It's just going to have the ID and then the name of the category. So let's see how we can model this. Go ahead and try it yourself first if you'd like by following our existing examples. I'll go ahead and show you how to do it here. So we export const categories is equal to PG table. I'll call the table categories. And now in my columns, we're going to have our auto incrementing ID as we have before. Import everything from PG core and mark it as the primary key. And now finally for the name, I'll call this column. This will be text and we'll mark this as not null. So let's say the category cannot be null. So in default in Postgres with Drizzle, any value provided to our columns can be null accepted. Well, to mark it that it cannot be null, you have to use the not null constraint like so. So we have our categories table defined. Let's now go ahead and create this new table that I had mentioned before that's going to actually record the relation between a category and a post. So, so this posts to categories table is what I'm going to call it, is going to store the post ID and the category ID for any given relation. And that's going to track the posting category together. So this is going to, again, be a new table. So we export const posts to categories. And this is now equal to PG table again, and I'll call it posts underscore to underscore categories. And now let's take a look at the columns. So as I mentioned, in this table, we're going to record the post ID and the category ID for a single relationship that associates the post and category together. The post ID is simply an integer. That's the primary key on the posts we know. I'll call this post ID. We need to mark this as not null. And finally, just as we've done before, this is still a foreign key. We have to tell it that it references the primary key on posts.id. So make sure we import posts from our post schema. So we're going to go ahead and do the same exact thing now for the category ID. So go ahead and paste this. And now instead of referencing posts, this is just simply going to reference the categories table that we just defined. So now we have this table that's recording the relationships for a given post and category. The last thing we want to do now is actually define a second parameter to PG table, and that's going to be extra config. So in here, we can actually define a callback function that gets access to the current schema or underlying columns that we just defined. And in this callback function, we return another object. So in here, we can have this PK property, which is going to assign a primary key to this table. So to do this, we can call primary key from PG core. And I want this primary key to be a compound primary key that consists of two fields, and that's going to be the t dot post ID and the t dot category ID, because both of these together are going to form a unique primary key, right? We're not going to have a post and category ID duplicated twice. We're just going to have this relationship marked once in this table, and that's what we're doing by telling it to make it as a compound primary key. 
All right, so now with the table finally generated, we still need to tell Drizzle about this relationship. So let's go ahead and start off with the export const post to categories relations is equal to the relations from Drizzle ORM. So we pass in our post to categories table. And now in the callback function here, we're going to extract the one parameter. And this is because we're going to be associating a single post ID here to a single post and a single category ID here to a single category. So extract one. And now let's define the relation for the post and the relation for the underlying category inside of this post to categories table. So a given post is going to be set equal to the one function with the post table and the fields is simply the posts to categories post ID. So that's the foreign key here. And now the primary key in references is posts.id. That's the underlying field that we're trying to map to. Go ahead and now do the same thing for category. So we pass in the categories table, the fields here. Well, that's the foreign key. Of course, we know this is going to be post to categories dot category ID now. And finally, references is going to be categories.id to map to the underlying category. Make sure we surround this object in parentheses so we immediately return it and add some commas here to fix this syntax error. So now we have the relations defined on post to categories to expand these actual ID fields. Let's finally go ahead and describe the relation on the category itself. So export const categories relations equal to relations. So categories here. And now for the callback, this is where we're going to expand and use the many function finally. So here we say posts to categories is the many relationship where we pass in many posts to categories for a single category. So this is a syntax to define the many to many relationship. We're saying for a given category, we're going to have this new relation that we call post to categories that references the post to categories table. And then here we defined, of course, how to actually map the IDs to an underlying post or category. So let's go ahead and finally implement the relation on the post side. I have a typo here for the category ID. So make sure that this is called category ID. And in here, just like we did for the category in post relation, we're going to add the new posts to categories property. And this is now equal to the many function, which we need to destructure. So call many and pass in that post to categories table. So now our many to many relation is defined. Let's go ahead and follow our usual pattern. So we'll generate new migration scripts for this. We will go ahead and run the drizzle kit migrate command to apply the migrations against our database. So just like we've done before, let's now go into our categories controller and add some new routes to expose the categories. So in here, let's go ahead and firstly add a post route to create a new category. So we'll add async create category. And for the at body decorator, we'll add the request, which will simply set equal to an, a literal type here where we'll say we only accept the name of type string. And we'll now go ahead and need to get access to the private read only categories service. So go ahead and inject this. And now in our post route, we'll return this dot category service create category and pass in that request object. So now we can create a category. I'll add a new get route called async get categories and we'll return all of them now. So go ahead and just like we've done this dot category service dot get categories. And I now want to create one more route that's going to allow us to associate a category with a post by creating a new entry in that post to categories table. So let's go ahead and create this new post route and I'll call this post. So async add to post method that will take in at body. And here 
I'll define the request with a type that is going to now take in both the post ID of type string and the category ID of type string. So again, these are the two columns we defined in that post to categories table to track this relationship. This dot category service, add to post and pass in the request. So now let's go to the category service and implement our functionality. Firstly, go into the categories module and in our imports array as we've done, go ahead and import the database module so we can get access to it. We also want to go back into that database module and update our schema to add the category schema now. So again, follow this same pattern of importing star as category schema from categories slash schema. So now we have the category schema in our root schema. Let's go back to the category service for now. We can actually inject the database connection using the at inject decorator, passing that constant, and we'll mark this private read only database as the node PG database and take in type of schema. And now I want to import star as schema from dot slash schema. So we now have the database connection and we can implement our three methods. Let's start off with async create category, which is going to take in the category parameter of type of schema dot categories dot infer insert. So now we await this dot database dot insert pass in schema dot categories as the table and values is the new category. So we can create a category async get categories now. Here all we do is return this database dot query and now we can see the categories table and let's call find many. Let's also pass in our options object and expand on with where now we can see the post to categories relation that we defined earlier. So set this to true so we'll get back all the posts in categories relations. Now last but not least we also need to create async add to post. So this will get passed in the post to category request object and this will be type of schema dot posts to categories infer insert. And now we await this dot database dot insert schema dot post to categories is the table and dot values will take in the post to category. So now we've implemented our three methods. If we go back to the categories controller and thanks to our drizzle ORM type safe schema, we can see the compiler is actually telling us that this is invalid. The drizzle schema knows that the post ID and category ID here should be in fact numbers from our schema, not strings as we've defined them. So this is a great benefit of drizzle. It's actually catching any mismatches between what we pass in and the parameters to this function, which it knows is the post ID and category ID, both numbers. So let's update our parameters to be numbers and not strings. All right, so let's go ahead and give this a try in Postman. I'll launch a request at slash categories to create this new category. And here we know we just have that single string value of name. So I'll call this lectures as the category. Send the request so we have a 201 created. Let's launch a get request now to see we get it back and post to categories is empty because there are no matching records in our post to categories table with this category ID. However, let's fix this. Let's launch a new post request at category slash post. So now we're going to associate this category with a post by passing in the post ID. So in my case, that'll be one with this new category ID. So category ID we know is one as well. So we now pass this in. And now at this point, let's go ahead and relaunch this get request to fetch all of our categories. So now if we send this off, we can actually see post to categories has now been populated with this entry 
in the post categories table. So any post categories with this matching category ID will be supplied here so that we always know what post is associated with this given category ID and we could look up this post as well if we wanted to to get more details about it. So just like we saw before as well, we can go ahead and implement this relationship on both sides. So let's say for example, for a given post, if we updated get posts here to now set post to categories to true as well, we can now launch a get requests at slash posts. And in addition to the user, we now get back the post to categories array, which is all the categories IDs associated with this post. So this is how we implement this many-to-many -many relationship. And finally, if we take a look at our tables, I want to show you this actual post to categories table. So in here, we are actually recording the underlying post ID and category ID, both primary keys as we specified in the schema. So now we've looked at all type of relations using Drizzle RM. All right, next up, I want to take a look at filters in Drizzle. So let's say, for example, we want to actually filter our data in the database and look only for a post with a given ID. Well, to do this, we can use Drizzle filters. So let's go to our post controller and create this new get route that's going to take in a URL path parameter. So in Ness, we signify this with the at colon in the route name. We'll say ID. So now we'll create async get post so this is a singular post, and we can use at param decorator to extract this path parameter with the name ID, which matches the route decorator. So this will be the underlying post ID of type string. And now let's return this dot post service dot get singular post and pass in pars int. So we're going to pass in the post ID string to turn it into a number value and make sure we're calling get post here. So now let's go to our post service and implement this new method async get post get passed in the post ID of type number. And now let's go ahead and return this dot database dot query dot posts. And now we'll use find first instead of find many to look for a singular post. And so now we pass in an options object where we set the where property equal to our filter. So Drizzle offers a bunch of filters out of the box. And again, we can see these inside of their docs directly. All of these different filter functions we have access to, to actually select the data we want based on some sort of condition. So in our case here, we're going to use the equal filter to get a post equal to this post ID. So now all we have to do is set where equal to the equal function. And now we simply pass in the column that we're actually looking again. So in our case, we know that's going to be schema.posts.id. And then the second parameter is the underlying value. So that's the post ID here now. So with this in place, we now have our equal filter applied. Let's go back to Postman and launch a get post request with slash one to have that path parameter. And now we can see we only get back that singular post with the ID equal to this one value. So this is how we can apply filters using Drizzle, and we can use any filter we want based off of the docs that we just saw. So finally, let's take a look at how we can update a record inside of Drizzle. So back in the post controller, let's create a new at patch route, where we'll again accept the ID as a path parameter. And this will be async update post. And so this is only going to take in, let's say the content value that we want to update the content on the post. So we'll extract at body, get the request. And I'll say this is of type object where content is equal to string. And now let's go ahead and return this dot post service dot update post. And we also need to extract the path parameter here, just like we did in the get route. So again, use param ID to extract that post ID in the actual URL. So we have this post ID of type string coming in from the URL and our body. Let's pass in pars int with the post ID. 
and the underlying request itself. And now let's go to the post service and implement this. So async update post now, again, takes in the post ID number and the underlying update request. And just like we did for the insert, we can also use the inferred insert value here for the request. It's so now for the second parameter. Let's take in the post we're now updating. So I'll say, again, just like we did for insert, this type will be type of schema dot posts dot infer insert. So any value on that given post. And now to actually finally update, we'll await this dot database dot post. And now we use the dot update method here, which is going to take in again, the table we're applying the update to. We know that's schema dot posts and we call dot set now to actually set the new value. In our case, that's just going to be the post coming in. And finally, we have the dot where function to actually apply a filter. So just like we applied our equal filter here for get post, we'll apply the same filter. So we want to look for the post under posts.id as the field where the post ID equals and make sure this is schema dot posts as well. So now we're looking for the correct post to update, setting the values. Let's go ahead and give this a try. So if we look for our post here, we see our content is great post. Let's change this to patch now instead. And I'll now set the content field to really great post, send it off. So we have a 200 response. And now let's again launch that get request where now we can see the updated content value. When we insert a new value into the database or apply an update, we can get the newly updated value back. Now to do this, we call the dot returning function. And so by default, this will return the updated objects. And finally, make sure we also return this object. So we get back the updated value. So now back in Postman, if we launch a patch request to update this post again and pass in some exclamation marks, for example, send it off, we can see we now get back the updated value in the response thanks to the dot returning function. All right, so there's a couple more things I want to show you with Drizzle. The first thing is going to be how we implement transactions. So transactions in a database is a way to essentially roll back our operations if some sort of error occurs in, in the middle of the process. So for example, let's say we have a request that creates an entry that creates an entity and then updates another one in a different database. Well, if the update fails, we can roll back all of the previous database operations so that they don't persist unless all of them succeed. And this is an atomic database transaction. So let's see how we can do these transactions in Drizzle. So to implement this example, let's firstly update our post controller. So now in create post, let's go back to our create post request. And let's say here we can pass in an optional category as a string. So we'll say we can create a category when we also create a post at the same time, if we pass in a category with it. So let's go to create post. And now what I want to do is also now create this new category and associate it with the post in this same method. So let's go ahead and see how we can do this. Firstly, in the post service, I'll go ahead and inject now the category service. So go ahead and inject the category service. So we have access to it. We'll also need to make sure that we import the categories module. So we have access to all of its exports and providers. And now in the categories module, Make sure we explicitly export the category service so that the post service can use it. And so now back in create post, the first thing I want to do is update our parameters. So we'll take in the post that we're inserting as the first parameter and then the optional category name as the second parameter. So now go back to the post controller and let's pass in the first object where we know we have the content coming from the request dot content and the user ID coming from the request dot user ID. So that's the first parameter, the actual post we're creating. And then if we have a category, 
that'll be request.category. So now we're passing these in as separate parameters to create posts. We go ahead and insert the post here. And so after we insert it into the database, let's check to see if category was passed into us. If it was passed in, then I want to then call category service, create category, and pass in our category. So that's going to be the name set equal to the category parameter. So now we've created the post, created the category, and finally it's time to associate the two. So we call add to post and pass in this object. So we know we need to pass in the post ID. Well, in order to do this, we need to get access to the returned post here that we got back from the insertion call. We know how to do this thanks to that dot returning function we just saw. So let's take a look at how we can do this. Const post is equal to, now the created post, we call dot returning at the end to get the returned value. Now as we can see in the docs here, we can actually tell it to only give us the fields that we want by passing in this object with the columns that we want. So in this case, we can prevent returning values over the wire we don't care about. In this case, really all we want here is the ID. And we know that column is the schema.posts.id. Now by default, this is going to return us an array as well. Let's go ahead and set this to posts as the const. So we're getting back that post. And now the post ID here will be posts at entry zero dot ID. So that's the post ID of the post we just created. And finally, we need the category ID. So let's go ahead and implement the same logic in create category. We'll actually return the created category back to the caller called dot returning and say we only want the ID value. So the ID value is schema dot categories dot ID. And again, we only want the first value from the array, which is the created category. So we can wrap this in parentheses, explicitly await the call, and then return element zero at the array. So now we have the category being returned, the category ID that is. And so we can go ahead and destructure that from the call to create category and get back the underlying ID and let's pass that in as the category ID now. So now let's go ahead and test this flow end to end by creating a new post. So we'll create this add post request, we'll keep our content, I'll say my user ID of one, and now let's set this category to nest.js. So let's say we're creating this new category along with the post itself and send off this request. We can see we got back a 201 create it. And now if we launch get posts and say get the post back, well we see the new post that we just created here including the new category we generated. So that's excellent. We can also launch a get request at slash categories to explicitly see this new category with the name nest.js. So this is working as we'd expect. Let's now go ahead and see how we can implement a transaction here because for example let's say after we create this new post in the database, well, let's say if we had a category passed in and for some reason this create category call or even this add to post call failed, we want to roll back this post creation because we want all of these operations to succeed atomically as one operation. Now to do this in Drizzle, again, we use a transaction, which is very easy to implement. All we have to do to implement a transaction in Drizzle is a call await database dot transaction. We now have async and get access to the underlying TX property here. And so now inside of this callback, we have a transaction. If any error is thrown, all of the database operations will be rolled back. So all of these operations will either succeed or fail together. The only thing we have to do now is instead of referencing this dot database in this callback, we now reference the TX property whenever we use the database. So we use TX to insert the new post. And to this also means we have to update our category methods here to accept an optional TX property of type node PG transaction. 
And so this expects a couple of type arguments. We'll set these as any. So now we have the underlying transaction. We'll check to see first if a transaction was passed, then we'll use that, or then we'll use the database. So we can simply wrap this in parentheses and say TX or this dot database is what we're going to use to insert the value. We'll go ahead and do the same thing for add to post as well. We'll check to see if TX was passed, we'll use this or this dot database. So now a post service, in addition to passing in the payloads, we'll pass in the underlying transaction as well so that these operations know about the current tra transaction we're in. So let's firstly go ahead and just make sure everything is still working as we'd expect by creating a new post and a new category. Send this off. We still get this 201 created response. We still get our new category. Now let's see what happens if we implement an artificial error. Firstly, let's see if we get all posts. Do we still see our new post? Yep, we do. So let's go ahead and throw a stub error. So even after we create the transaction, let's say there's some error we throw now. So throw new error, error. So we're never going to actually reach this code to create the new category. We're going to throw an error. And we should expect this post to actually get rolled back and not persisted into the database. Let's see if that's the case. And send this new request to create the post with the category. Send it off and make sure this is a post request. So now you can see we're getting back an internal server error as we'd expect. Now let's check to see if we launch another get request. Do we see this new post that got created? We do not because we were in a database transaction. All of our subsequent database operations has been rolled back. So this is how we can achieve this atomic database operation with transactions in Drizzle. So the last thing I want to show you is just how we can implement tests using Drizzle in Nest.js in the way we've implemented this. So let's take a look at our user service where we're injecting this database connection. So we have the user service spec file that got generated. Where we're simply just checking to see if our user service can compile so in here we have the testing module where we apply a single provider, that's the user service. Now a quick note here is make sure your imports in this project don't have any references to source and we are importing relatively here, otherwise our tests can have some errors in them out of the box. So make sure our imports don't have source in them. And so now if we go back to our terminal and run pnpm test users dot service, we can see the test is actually failing because it's complaining it doesn't know about this database connection provider in the user server. So we didn't f define it in the testing module. So let's fix this. So if we go back to the user service now, we can go into the providers array and let's provide a new provider here where we set provide and we're going to simply reference the same injection token that with the user service is utilizing. So that database connection token, we can simply set use value equal to an empty stub object. So now we actually have this provider set to this object literal, and we should be able to actually instantiate the service and of course fix our import here as well. And so now if we rerun the test command, you can see our test is now succeeding. So we've implemented a lot of functionality from Drizzle ORM in this lecture. I hope you have learned a lot and maybe we'll consider using Drizzle for your next project. And so as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, I will leave a link to the Drizzle docs. I highly recommend going through these in length if you want to learn more about Drizzle and try using it in your next project to really get a good understanding. I hope you've learned so much in this lecture and thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.